I'm Michael Greif. I directed um, the reading of Heralded Lillian at South Coast Rep. And it's my pleasure to be here today with the authors of Harold and Lillian the Musical, Julianne Wick Davis and Dan Collins. And they're saying hi. hi. <laughs> and I'm gonna ask them a couple of questions and I hope that uh, in the course of this conversation, you'll get to know them a little better. And. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna ask is how uh, they began working together. How did they meet? And um, and how did they actually start collaborating? Yeah, well, we, um, I'll, I'll take part of this and pass it on to Julianne at, at some point um, when it's obvious. <laughs> we met uh, in uh, 2005, right? Um, mm -hmm. at the at NYU Tisch, um, the musical theater writing program. We both moved to New York um, in pursuit of musical theater writing dreams. Um, and we occupied that program together for two years from 2005 to 2007. Um, and the first year of that program, essentially they, they paired together, um, I, I'm, I'm a words person, uh, book and lyrics in, in, in the, this case of Harold and Lillian. Um, and Julianne is a composer, also a, a lyricist, but we were working together in that first year as I would usually be doing book and lyrics. Um, projects, not whole musicals. So it was just one, you know, like a AABA song or a verse chorus. And they would, it was sort of speed dating for musical theater writing. Each week you'd be with a different person. Um, and when Julianne and I uh, paired up together, it was it was a good speed date, lots of clicking. Um, and our second year, we, we chose to write our thesis project together. Um, and uh, the rest is kind of history, but I'll let Julianne fill in some of it. Too. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, it was just this opportunity to work together and there was definitely uh you know a chemistry and we immediately had a shorthand uh we found that we really were drawn to the same kinds of stories and um and just enjoyed each other's company so that was you know, that, that's a pretty positive formula for our collaboration so yes uh, especially in a graduate program i can imagine Right. Was on. Yes. Yeah. So, um, can you tell us what some of that um, subject matter was on those first collaborations? Yeah, I think you know we've always been kind of drawn to, um, I, I guess, like marginalized uh, characters. Um, our first piece that we did together was was a um, it was a crazy romp. Actually, it was a Midsummer Night's Dream adaptation that had uh, a gay theme to it. Um, and the next project that we worked on was Southern Comfort, which was about a transgender community based on the documentary Southern Comfort. Um, and then we've just continued to kind of be drawn to uh, those kinds of stories and not just LBGTQ, but also to uh, stories of people who are kind of the underdog, um, which I think kind of relates a little bit more to Harold and Lillian in yes. which they were, you know, in the background of these iconic films and were really responsible for so much of the success of these iconic films, but we never heard about them before. Yes, exactly. Um, tell me, tell me a bit more about those early, those earliest collaborations before you got to Southern Comfort, or before you got back to Southern Comfort, I should say. Right. Um, I mean, at, at NYU, I recall the the first project was about. Um, uh, I can't remember what it, I mean, it was specifically about having a community ensemble behind a, an individual. Um, what did they call that, Julianne? It was the... I think it was the ensemble assignment. It was just ensemble. <laughs> that was our first assignment. Um, and it was specifically about, you know, so we, we met and it was talking about what's an interesting individual character 
to put in, in you know, um, in front of a, um, a, a community, a backdrop um, uh, of people. So, I mean, that is one of the ways we really started honing in on the kind of characters, the sort of marginalized characters that we might be interested in, in writing about. Um, and this, the, the first project we did at NYU, as Julianne mentioned, was, was, it was loosely based off of Midsummer Night's Dream, but um, it, kind of, it kind of sprung from this project we did at uh, NYU, which, which, <laughs> which it just ended up a bit, it, in, in the shortest terms, it was about uh, this uh, woman who went out to these, this, this, um, these woods on the outskirts of her communities to search for her husband, who she learned or suspected was, was um, meeting men in the, mm -hmm. there in the woods there. It was like a cruising spot. So she decided to go find him. And then the community behind her were, were these men cruising. Um, and that, yes, that became the, uh, the juxtaposition between her and the community. And, and so some of that idea transferred over to this, this um, Midsummer Night's Dream adaptation we did uh, as our thesis project, which, you know, had fairies in the woods, but you can kind of guess what sort of fairies those were and what kind of woods those were. And, and that was just sort of a, a, that was our exploration project <laughs> at NYU. What, what was the moment like when you actually both left the program but decided to stay together? Oh, that's a really, that's a really good question. I think, I mean, our, our collaboration was you know, successful for each other. I mean, the first piece that we wrote together was just crazy and fun and ridiculous and just like so over the top in so many ways. And, but it seemed to appeal to, you know, mm -hmm. some people that we knew. So um, we got some affirmation about the work that we were doing together. And I think that was helpful. And also I think we were just both in the same place of really wanting to do this. It wasn't, yeah. You know, I, I think we were at the place in our lives where, like, let's keep writing and let's keep doing stuff and putting our material out there and hopefully, you know, be recognized for it. And I think that had a lot to do with it because I know there are a lot of, you know, people that kind of think that this is what they want to do and then they realize, like, the amount of work that you have to do for very little um, affirmation right. and you have to keep going at it even though you're not getting that affirmation and you have to do it because you absolutely love it and you can't imagine yourself doing anything else and I think that's something that both um, both of us had you know that was the way that we were leaving grad school like this is the thing that we want to do and that was I think huge for us in a collaboration absolutely um, yeah well, and I think, uh, as Julianne hints at a little bit too, we had this this piece that ended up being our thesis project was you know this sort of fun romp, but we were we were flirting with a few ideas, and mm -hmm. after all that, we still knew that we we had fun writing this sort of piece together, but we we loved working with each other, and we loved how, you know what we did for one another's work. We wanted to we still wanted to do those sort of more dramatic, more serious ideas together. We wanted to kind of see what the other side of our, you know, we weren't, we weren't done yet exploring what, what other sort of subject matters looked like and sounded like, you know, between us. So it was exciting to be able to keep doing that. That's, that is exciting and wonderful that you found one another. And tell, tell us a little bit about postgraduate school, what some of those projects were that came to fruition. So we're going to talk about Southern Comfort in a minute. Are there other collaborations that you'd like to talk about? things that saw the light of day? Um, I mean, chronologically, Southern Comfort was probably the next, you know, the uh, yeah. Oh, then let's do that. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was I, the next I, project because I think the person, you know, the person who we did, um, our thesis actually, you know, went to NIMF and everything. So the director of that project. That is what NIMF is. Oh, you know, sure, because it's not, and all of these, anymore. all of these developmental steps, I think, are really fascinating. So, yeah, it's uh, the New York Musical Theater Festival that mm -hmm. um, I think doesn't exist now after a couple of years, but it was like the 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 city 
new musical theater festival opportunity that you I'm going to tell everybody that it's a very big deal to be accepted into that program. So the two of you are very distinguished to be that, that project to, to be accepted. So yeah, no, thank you. It was highly, I mean, highly competitive in that there were a lot of shows that were applying and hundreds and hundreds. Yes. Yeah. And and so we have that opportunity with our thesis, which again was this great affirmation of the work that we were doing together. But the director, uh, Tom Caruso, had optioned the documentary Southern Comfort and had actually approached um, various writing teams over a couple of years, I think. Mm -hmm. And and people had not really been able to, con I, I won't speak for why it didn't work for them, but I think um, it just wasn't working for other collaborations and people weren't, I guess, finding their way into it. And, and granted, when he approached us and said, would you take a look at this documentary? We're, you know, we're trying, he and his um, partner, Tom Dussault, their partner in, in this particular project, um, they were looking for a team and they were kind of giving up on the idea of it becoming a musical. And uh, we watched the documentary <clears throat> and it was clear to us why it was a challenge to see it as a musical, just because taking real life, as you well know, like taking real life and then turning it into something theatrical is is a bit of a challenge. And but we watched it again, and then we were kind of you know finding our way into it and thinking about what the sound world could be of the piece. And then we got really excited about it and started uh, working, you know, started just writing it and uh, Tom and, and Bob were very uh, responsive to the work that we were doing for the piece. And we just really fell in love with this community of people that we were writing about. Yes, that's very clear from knowing your beautiful adaptation. What were some of the steps after Nymph in, before, before it was fully produced? Yeah. Damn. Damn. <laughs> well, uh, so, well, Nymph was specifically. Uh, I, I will. I will utter the name of this other project. That uh, was our thesis project. It was called Wood, and Nymph was. Um, Wood was part of Nymph, and it it had. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it had some, some productions afterwards, but nothing. You know, nothing that really ever. Um, uh, was bigger than Nymph. Oh, I, I forgive me. I was asking a misleading question. So yeah, but but Nymph was where no no so totally fine. Nymph is where the relationship uh, started with with Tom Caruso, who was right. a director who had the underlying rights. Right. So essentially, after the the conversation of wanting to work on something else together, after our experience at Nymph, and then watching that documentary, um, uh, was was sort of the the first step in that project. Post Nymph, it, we we just started writing Southern Comfort. It became our next our next project. And then how did it get to the public theater? Wow, that was a that was a long journey. <laughs> they tend to be long journeys. Yes. Yes. Ending. The typical musical theater journey, I think. But we we started with a a reading that Playwrights Horizons uh, actually uh, sponsored for us, and then at that reading, I believe that's when uh, uh, Eliza Ventura. Uh, saw the piece and was really interested and they had cap 21 at the time which actually no longer exists this is another organization that was doing new musical theater and um cap 21 was was affiliated with nyu was it a program at nyu no it was actually originally cap 21 was part of uh the theater training undergrad theater training it was a part of one of the studios at nyu and then it it kind of oh, completely left NYU and remained and and became a uh -huh. Right. And then they became not only uh, a training school for actors, but it was also they were developing new work, which they, um, you know, they were pretty fantastic in what mm -hmm. um, the kind of opportunities that they were giving for people at the time, because as we all know, there are a few of them. So um, they were really interested in. 
um, producing Southern Comfort and giving us like a workshop production of it. And it ended up being like this really beautiful, in their black box, uh, almost felt environmental the way um, the piece was done and was the thing that really kind of got people's attention uh, with a piece. And, and we had had other theaters that were saying they were interested, like they liked the piece, they thought it was a beautiful piece, but they didn't think it was right for their theater. Mm -hmm. And there was, you know, this was back in 2010, 2011. Um, and, you know, the, the transgender stories were not as uh, present and a part of the zeitgeist as they are now and people's awareness of it. And, you know, we had people leaving the theater during the middle of our show, you know, because they were, once they realized what the piece was about and, you know, it was that kind of experience, but it was also like this really beautiful, um, uh, intimate theater experience that, um, that was, I think really helped us um, get the piece out there in a way that we, we had not had that opportunity before. Right, and um, I imagine that that intimacy was not only inspirational, but also a, a real guide for how you had to continue working on the piece. Uh, uh, it, it gave you real insight into how to most successfully continue producing it, even as you moved on to other spaces. Correct. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. We should uh, move on to Harold and Lillian. And um, you've already alluded to, I think, some of the reasons why you were drawn to this material, those unsung heroes, those voices we don't get to hear a lot about. But tell me a little bit about, first, some of the greatest challenges in adapting that material. I'm going to make Dan speak first. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, sim you know, similar to uh, what Julianne had mentioned about Southern Comfort, and we had, fortunately, we had already had an experience with sort of diving into a documentary and, and, and figuring yeah. out how to find a, a story in there. Um, but, uh, you know, I think w one of the great challenges of, of the documentary was that those, those characters as themselves on the screen um, were so electrifying and so entertaining and all they needed to do was sit there and talk to the camera. And the challenge is, is, is somehow capturing that electricity and, and uh, that is captured on screen in a documentary and, and finding a way to, to transfer that to a narrative where other people will be portraying these characters, um, where there will be scenes and, and singing and um, just all these other elements that, that you're trying to put on um, a, a story that isn't really, I mean, the documentary spanned about six decades of, of a career. Yes. Well, so the, the other challenge was that we knew um, at the from the beginning, we knew that um, Annette O'Toole and Michael McKean were, were the artists that we were planning to work with as Harold and Lillian. So it also made us realize that we, this wasn't gonna be a project where we had, you know, someone playing a young Harold and Lillian and someone mm -hmm. playing a Harold and Lillian at this point in their life and mm -hmm. then playing Harold and Lillian at this point. So right. the challenge became both figuring out a way, you know, finding a narrative and a story and a spine um, to to follow through this musical, this 90 minute musical. And then um, also in the context of knowing that we were going to be seeing and hearing from the characters um, at uh, this later stage in their life and their marriage. So we couldn't really keep it a surprise that they ended up being together for their whole lives, you know, that we couldn't really keep make it a surprise that their careers ended up uh, arriving where they arrived. Uh, so I think that uh, that combined with just finding what what the story was just beyond the fact that these characters were interesting and fascinating. And also so much about their story was, was um, and so much about what was amazing about the documentary was seeing bits and pieces from these films that they were involved in Right. Um, hearing hearing about those films and on stage, while that can be interesting, it wasn't, you know, we weren't going to spend time seeing a scene from The Graduate or, um, you know, seeing a bunch of movie posters or, and things like that. So it was just, it was taking all these things that were fascinating about them that worked one way on film and in a documentary and just, just trying to figure out how to bring that spirit to the story. 
you know, without the tools that a documentary was able to use. Yes. Julianne, do you want to add to some of the challenges or do you want to jump to the greatest rewards of adapting <laughs> the piece and getting to work on the piece? Um, well, I think, I don't know if this falls into either one of those categories, but I think, you know, for me and in, in seeing this documentary and learning more about them, I, I think for me, the thing that was the most inspiring and exciting to to work on was you know, Lillian, I, I felt like she was such an incredible or is an incredible um, woman who was ahead of her time and was right. really pushing the boundaries in a time when women were, you know, they were either typists um, and or or they stayed at home and uh, were mothers. And she she, uh, you know, kind of saved her family and and on several occasions and uh, was also responsible for, you know, like I said, helping these iconic films. And uh, she's just an incredible woman with, um, with a real vision for just doing this thing that she wanted and never found an obstacle that she couldn't overcome. So I think that is, that to me was incredibly inspiring. Mm. So writing for her was always like an interesting and easy thing to do. Um, well, I think that the people who get to see this reading will really feel, you know, that love and admiration in the material you created for both Harold and Lillian. It's been a real pleasure getting to talk to you about it again. Thank Thanks. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.